Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, March 14th, 2023. It's 9 a.m. and we're in the Century Jury Room of the Ralph H. Walton Jr. Justice Center at 1200 West Pearl Street in Granbury, Texas. This is a regular meeting of the Commissioner's Court of Hood County, Texas. Today, we are pleased to welcome once again, for the fifth time, Pastor Raul Sandoval of the Iglesias Cristiana Vino Nuevo Church here in Hood County. And he brings one of his six children with him. He says the invocation in Spanish, and one of his children always translates into English. We look forward to this every time. So, Pastor Sandoval, please give us the invocation. Let's pray. Señor Padre Santo, Dear God, te damos muchas gracias. We give you thanks today, God, for nuestras vidas. For our lives. Te damos muchas gracias. We give you much thanks. Porque podemos vivir en este hermoso pueblo de Granbury. Because we can live in this beautiful city of Granbury. Gracias por los líderes. Thank you for the leaders. Que han hecho el trabajo. That has done their work de vivir en paz en esta comunidad. They have lived their peace in this community. Gracias por la comunidad de Granbury. Thank you for the community of Granbury. Gracias porque podemos tener paz en este pueblo. Thank you because we are able to have peace in this city. Gracias por la sabiduría de estos líderes. Thank you for the wisdom of these leaders. Te pedimos we ask you que sigas bendiciendo. To keep blessing them. Que sigas dando sabiduría. To keep giving them knowledge and wisdom. Que nos sigas dando un pueblo en paz. To keep giving us a peaceful community of Granbury. Y que podamos siempre honrar tu nombre. And that we can always honor your name. Lo pedimos. We ask. En el nombre de Cristo Jesús. In the name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Would you please join me in a pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Thank you all, all very much. Okay. I want to remind everybody that we got a lot of people here today that if you want to speak, uh, you must sign a public participation form that the sheriff has in the back and uh, the sheriff will then hand them to Miss Lang who will put you in order and then we will call you at the appropriate time. So the next order of business is special presentation and the first presentation is a proclamation declaring March 29th, 2023 Welcome Home Vietnam Veterans Day. This is a very important, long time overdue uh, honor here. Is there anybody here from this organization here? There you go, right there. Ms. Cook, is that you? Come on up. Let me see that. I, who has? <laughs> there. I'm going to bring it to you down there and let you and let you read it, okay? Okay, you can read it to the last one. Just barely made it. Sorry, And this is Bob Pinnell, also known as Julia's husband here, in case anybody would like to know that. I'm right, the driver. Bob? You're the driver. Okay, here it is. You want to read this, Ms. Cook? Thank you. Okay. The 
speak into the microphone. Whereas our nation's Vietnam War commemoration gives us the opportunity for all Americans to recognize, honor, and thank our v Vietnam veterans and their families for their service and sacrifices during the Vietnam War from November 1, 1955 through May 15, 1975. And whereas over 9,000 organizations across America have joined with the Department of Defense as a commemorative partner to honor our nation's Vietnam veterans, including all 197 chapters of the Texas Daughters of the American Revolution, National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. And whereas this commemoration includes Three, uh, nine million Americans with approximately 7.2 million of them living today and makes no distinction who served in country, in theater, or were stationed elsewhere during these 20 years. All answered the call of duty. And whereas in 2016, Veterans Affairs Secretary Robert A. McDonald designated March 29th, the last day of the U.S. troops were on the ground in Vietnam as a day to honor those who have borne the battle and to extend gratitude and appreciation to them and their families now. Therefore, I, Ron Massingale, judge of the Hood County, along with all members of the Hood County Commissioner's Court, do hereby proclaim March 29th, 2023, as Welcome Home Vietnam Veterans Day. I would like to mention that Friends of Memorial Lane will have an event on March 29th, starting at 10 a.m. down at uh, the Jim Burke's uh, Firefighters Park. So we all are invited. It'll be a short, probably 30-minute event. So we'd love to have you there with us. Thank you. Thank you all very much. You may keep that. I have other copies there, Ms. Cook. Okay. Okay. The next presentation is a proclamation declaring April Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Is there anybody here? What, go to, yes, ma'am. Come on up here. Let me see. Okay, how are you? Let me make sure. Yep. We've all signed this. What is your name, please? Rebecca Freeman. Rebecca Freeman here. You want to read this, Rebecca Freeman? Yeah, read yes, I think you should. Let's give her. She's a little embarrassed, but I think we're a little bit encouraged for her to be here. Okay. Proclamation to designate April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Whereas sexual assault is a serious crime that touches all communities regardless of age, race, disability, gender, identity, or socioeconomic status. And whereas the Hood County Commissioner's Court recognizes and participates in public awareness campaign to support National Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And whereas Sexual Assault Awareness Month provides an excellent opportunity for citizens to learn more about preventing sexual assault and to show support for the organizations and individuals who provide critical advocacy services and assistance to victims and whereas on average there are 463 634,000 victims aged 12 or older of rape and sexual assault each year in the United States. Every 68 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted, and every nine minutes, that victim is a child. And whereas, on, the, on average, RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest, Incest National Network, the National Sexual Assault Hotline has helped more than 27,000 victims per month nationwide in 2022. And whereas, Mission Granberry provides services for victims of sexual assault, Mission Granberry's Victim Services Program served 274 sexual assault victims last fiscal year. And whereas preventing sexual assault means changing the social norms that allow and condone violence and requires the collective voice and power of individuals, families, institutions, and systems, 
each wholeheartedly committed to transforming our community. Now therefore, in recognition of the important work done by survivals, survivors, sexual assault programs, and victim service providers, the Hood County Commissioner's Court does hereby proclaim April 2023 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and urges all residents to become involved in efforts to prevent and respond to sexual assault and recognize the impact it has in our community. Thank you very much. Okay, now the third special presentation is the Texas Vital Statistics Section 2022 Five Star Award for Local Registrars. That's you, Ms. Lang? Yes. You gonna read this? Um, Go. I've got the award here. Okay, who are you presenting it to? This is, let me get up here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Commissioners. This is my office manager from Annex 2, Catherine Frost, and her and her team um, have done an exceptional job. The Texas Department of State Health Services has honored the county clerk's office with its five-star award for, award for local registrars. I'm so proud of their exceptional staff, of my exceptional staff for receiving this award. This award honors those go, who go above and beyond the duties of birth and death registration and keeps up with the legislative trends. It's rare to gain a five-star status. We have exceeded the state's highest standards for accuracy, thoroughness, timeliness, efficiency, and customer service. I have an exceptional staff that works well together, making this award almost expected. Thank you, Catherine and the Annex 2 Deputy Clerks for exceptional customer service and always putting the customers first. I support, congratulations. Now this is an award that uh, the next presentation that I'm really looking forward to, let me tell you what this is. Receive presentation from the Library Foundation Board regarding a $50,000 donation to the Hood County Library Bookmobile. Whoa, this is pretty nice. Jennifer Logsdon and Robin. Well, which one are you now, Colonel, <laughs> Miss Scott, Monty Lewis, yes. Mike Scott? Y'all coming down? These are too bashful. These guys never speak at anything. Miss Scott? Good morning, Judge and Commissioners. My name is Susan Scott, and I'm the president of the Hood County Library Foundation Board. Well, she, since I signed a check, she's going to let me talk. Uh, I'm David Wells. I'm the treasurer. And I'd just like to say that, uh, as you know, the foundation uh, for years has supported the library, uh, made significant contribution to expansion, the furnishing and support. Today, the foundation requests that you accept a donation of $50,000 to help fund the purchase of the little bookmobile. As you know, when you approved the bookmobile, we had to upgrade the, the vehicle because of the uh, uh, lack of the one that we were going to get. This $50,000 goes to correct and pay for the upgraded bookmobile. <clears throat> and this is a result of the many generous people in Hood County who have, over the years, donated to the library through the foundation. Uh, to date, the Library Foundation and Friends of the Library have donated over $570,000 in cash and grants to the county for library expansion, furnishings, and now the bookmobile. So, and the, it's Jennifer, Robin, Cookie, uh, you've got a great staff. Uh, they do a great job, and you're really going to appreciate this bookmobile. Look at, let them show this is fabulous here. tell you, that library foundation board and the library work so well together. Jennifer Logsdon and her crew get along with their staff, with their volunteers, with the public. 
I haven't received one single complaint about that library since Ms. Logsdon moved in up there, and I think that's remarkable. She does a tremendous job, and we're so lucky to have her, and I think across the county she works with everybody and does a very, very excellent job. So thank you all, Jennifer. Thank you, Susan Scott and Colonel David Wells and Monty Lewis. <laughs> God, why don't you have to have Monty and Mike with y'all? That kind of diminishes that a little good, and Mike Scott, so thank y'all all for doing a great job. Okay, next we have the open mic where citizens come in and they can just speak on any topic that they want to as long as it kind of relates to county politics. And uh, they each have five minutes, and we have five speakers here today. So the first speaker that signed up is Steve Biggers. Good morning, court. Thank you so much for this time. Um, today the topic is words and actions. So the First Amendment is a, is a really unique thing. One, it's the first. Two, it's only 45 words. And it's stood the, the, the stand of time over 230 plus years. And it's pretty clear on the five things that are natural rights that we as citizens have that cannot be infringed on. Religion, press, assemble, redress, and speech. The Texas Constitution comes back and reaffirms that in February of 1876, Article One, the Bill of Rights, Section 8, Article One, Section 27, same year, February 1876. So those things are pretty clear. Those are natural rights that the federal government recognizes and then our state, our great state does. So there's probably, probably a dozen elected officials in this room right now. And the common denominator that, that we as elected officials have is that we take an oath and, and we take it pretty seriously, these words, I, I would hope. We had a great event on the 1st of January where, where people stood up and took an oath and put their hand on the Bible and swore. And that oath pretty much goes, I do solemnly swear to affirm that I will faithfully execute whatever office you have for the state of Texas and preserve and protect and defend the Constitution, the laws of the United States, and the laws of this state. So many of you have taken it multiple times, Mrs. Lang, Mr. Eagle, so when you take that oath, those are the words, and then the actions follow up after that. And I was raised on words and actions, and if they don't match up, then there's a problem. Nobody, nobody has the authority to take these natural rights away from you, nobody. So on February 13th, I hired an attorney in February. On February 13th, the county judge was served from Nord Law Firm about the violation of your oath and your actions not matching up. And there was a deadline of March 1st, and that came and went. And that grieves me a little bit because I was hoping we could resolve this thing. So in all transparency, the commissioners need to know and get read in on this because it's coming to our county, folks. I'm not turning the other cheek this time. This was not fairly done to me or any other citizen in this county. You cannot do that. And the federal freight train's coming. So you as leaders of the county need to understand what the presiding officer got and how he ignored it and what's gonna be coming. This is not a spotlight I I cherish and want to go for, but this, this is a spotlight that needs to be shined. Because if, if it can happen to somebody as an elected official for just getting up and wanting to address, readdress the grievances, then it can happen to any of these people back here. And that's not right. That's not right at all. So I have copies for each one of you in the court and the clerk. I'm hoping we can deal with this 
and these words of the oath, take them a little more seriously and let the actions back them up. Thank you. Okay, next is Monica Brown. Ms. Brown. Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, the last time I was here, I was here talking about the sexually explicit books that were in the libraries here in Granbury. And today, I'm on a completely different topic, um, but I appreciate you having me here. And I do want to say, just as a side note, that there is a privately owned and publicly available library in formation so that you can go to a library and you won't find the sexually explicit young adult books in a youth section. So that is happening and it's going to be based on classic books. Just recently I researched the um, high school library here in town. No books on Ben Carson. I'm hoping everybody here knows who Ben Carson is, right? Um, pretty sure you can't find a book on Trump, which is kind of wild. Uh, or Sergeant, Sergeant York. So if you know who Sergeant York is, if you're old enough to know, personally, I think every child needs to know that. We watch his movie every year, we read his book. It's inspiring, and he was a national hero, but you will not find his book in our school libraries. I don't know about the public library, but that's the kind of books we need to make sure kids still have access to. Anyway, um, so I'm a mom. I have a total of nine children. I have six here with me today to learn about Commissioner's Court. It was a goal of mine to bring them in here. I want to take them to the um, City Council too. And they've been to some school board meetings as well so they can be civic-minded more than I ever was throughout my lifetime. I've always voted, but I never really understood how important these local things are. And I'm learning now, so it's been fun. But anyway, I have a son who is 17, and he was homeschooled his entire childhood and then entered a co-op, which is where teachers teach. And uh, our, our co-op, anyway, has teachers there three days a week. That really wasn't working for him, and he wanted to go ahead and get into the military. So instead of waiting for his diploma, he was close but not quite. Um, we found a tutor here in town. Her name is Janine McGregor. She's going to speak later today. But in a very short time, she assessed him. She found out where his weaknesses were for the GED because he could not enter the military without a proper diploma, and we wouldn't issue it until we knew he was finished. So we put him through her training and assessment. She honed in on what he needed, and what the Army recruiter told us is that if he could score, score high on GED, he would do well on the ASVAB. So his ASVAB score was a 75, which is very high. He, was, he had the jobs of his choice, which is great. And I know there's a lot of young people who really want to get into the military but really struggle with that test. So Janine is proposing to continue a program here in town where she can teach the GED and ASVAB and get anyone who's not, who doesn't have their GED but wants it, get them ready and get them through the program as well as ASVAB. So mostly I just wanted to uh, give my testimony today to say that um, it was very helpful for us because she took a load off of us to help him get qualified and just this week he finished basic training. We're going to go to his graduation in April. He's, been, he's being very successful, we're very proud of him, and we're grateful for that help to us as, homes, as a homeschool family to help us finish out his education, our part of it anyway. So that's, that was the main thing. I just wanted to share it, and hopefully what she's starting or what she's been doing for many years will continue to go on for other students here in Granbury. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Next is Mark Lowry. Okay. Next is Sherry Sullivan. <clears throat> Brady's speaking on item number three. Not open mic. Okay. So you are next. Okay. okay. How are you? I'm fine, so, thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me, and I'll be brief. Mine is more of a documentation question for the clerks and the citizens to review. Um, the time frames for uh, tested minutes um, seems to be haphazard at, at the 
best. So I was hoping that, um, I was hoping that I could have questions answered, which I know this isn't a form, but maybe somebody can get back to me, about how quickly those minutes are, number one, attested, number two, reviewed by somebody other than the county clerk, and posted in a timely manner so that if we do have questions as citizens, that um, it's not so far in arrears that we've forgotten what we um, listened to that day. Um, and thirdly, um, why are the public participation forms and the documents that are received by the clerks and yourself not attached to those minutes? Um, last is the minutes that I have seen online have not actually stated that they're minutes. They're just the agenda that has been updated with very generalized responses to the, to the agenda items. And I would appreciate if somebody could get back to me at some point um, and let me know the answer to those questions. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Okay, next is Harold Granick. Thank you, <laughs> Judge and Commissioners. Um, first, let me uh, allow me to uh, wish everybody a happy Pi Day, uh, a holiday special to my alma mater, and in advance, a happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, before I get in the tub topic I want to discuss, I respond to a previous speaker's thing is freedom of the speech. Uh, that is something that we've uh, all cherished, but the Supreme Court has previously said that it's not an unlimited uh, right, that you, for instance, you cannot yell fire in a crowded theater. Uh, and so I just want to remind the previous speaker that there are rules in society and in this uh, commissioner's court that one should follow. And if one can't follow them, then there are restrictions of one's freedom of speech. Uh, but that then relates to the second topic I want to talk about, and that is a report in the Hood County newspaper. Most of my information is related to that. And that's the Vernon case, where there were purportedly uh, a gentleman uh, asked another person about uh, the placement of political signs. Uh, apparently, though, the political signs had been placed on a property with the permission of the owner, and the gentleman uh, is reported to have asked a person who was on that property, can we take, remove these signs? They were uh, uh, removed. Uh, it was found, uh, seen by an eyewitness and reported. And uh, the information I'm doing, giving is all the, what I've read in the Hood County News. Uh, and the signs were found in the truck of the gentleman. Uh, but no prosecution or pursuit of the justice of this case were done. And uh, with a comment in the newspaper that there was, it was politically sensitive. Uh, that bothers me uh, that justice should be postponed or not allowed because of political uh, reasons. Uh, we, uh, this case, you know, seems to have a lot of evidence. I'm familiar with those who have a long memory of the case of uh, Cullen Davis in uh, uh, Fort Worth many decades ago where there was pursuit of um, uh, threats to a judge on another case that Cullen Davis was on, uh, the prosecutors, and I was famili am familiar with the prosecutors on that case, you know, had as evidence of uh, a tape recording and a videotape of the uh, Cullen Davis having threatened this judge, but because they were not synced, justice was not served those prosecutors would have loved to have had the kind of evidence we had on this case with the signs. Uh, I think it's very disturbing that uh, there was no action taken on this case 
from comments of political sensitivity. And for those of you at least are politicians and are going to have future signs, this sets a precedent that, well, maybe someone will look at your signs and say, ask some random person, can I take those signs? And you take them and say, if uh, the sheriff's department or such wants to arrest and the district attorney or county attorney wants to prosecute, say, well, there's a precedent. You know, someone said I could take it. So I think we should be very concerned about the precedent of if crime is committed or such, that it not be not prosecuted because of political sensitivity. We should have the same justice for everyone independent of the political party, independent of the influence, whether you're the most lowly person in the town or the president of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna get into our agenda items of miscellaneous business. Item number one is to discuss and take appropriate action to allow the Lake Granbury Area Beautification Council to put lighting in the trees at the courthouse square. And we have a list of really important people here. Uh, I noticed that Steve Berry was wandering around in the halls. He did not know where this building was. He <laughs> but I ushered him in. But his wife Joni is here. We have some Patsy Hurd is here. Your name is Tracy, uh, Stacy. <laughs> Okay. So we have some important people here to discuss about this important project here. <clears throat> Good morning, Where's Judge. Yours? How are you, sir? Uh, judge and Commissioners, uh, I am Steve Berry, 3201 Weatherford Highway. I understand that when your wife is on the Beautification Council, the, her, the husbands are too, is what Ronnie Heard told me a while ago. <laughs> they, uh, they wanted to address the court this morning. Uh, the Beautification Council's main fundraiser, as we know, is the Jewel Ball. They, uh, they have some items, and I believe Stacy handed out a packet to each court member as well. Uh, my wife, John Berry, Patsy Hurd, and Stacy Watkins Martin will uh, give the uh, spill and what's in your packet, and they'd like to talk about what they'd like to do for the beautification of our courthouse. Thank, Thank you, sir. Judge. Thank you. Okay. So you have the packets in front of you, and I'm just going to read what's in there so that the audience can know what we're talking about. Perfect. Um, the Lake Granbury Area Beautification Council would like to purchase LED color changing lights for the trees that outline the square. Um, it is the mission of our council to beautify Granbury and Hood County. The council will hire professionals to completely lace the trees and the branches to illuminate the streets on the square year round. The lights will have the ability to change colors depending on holiday season or special event and there's some photographs in there for y'all to kind of see what we're looking at. Um, these lights, um, several committees in Granbury have requested this project from us and it would be aesthetically pleasing to our town. Several close cities in Granbury have accomplished this project and we've included those photographs for y'all to look at. We want you to understand that um, our group, uh, the Lake Granbury Area Beautification Council, will not uh, charge it's not any cost to you it's completely we will pay for everything professionals will put these lights up and they will change them out as needed as the trees grow um, we are also donating large amounts of money to the city to do holiday lights around the square as well um, we would like to add this we would like for this project to add to that so with the approval of the commissioner's courts we would greatly appreciate your help Thank you, thank you. That was pretty good, huh? Thank you. Okay, Miss Martin, Miss Hurd, who's next? Oh, she read it all. Okay. Go ahead. Doing this would not only the beautification help in the city, but also all of the festivals that go in the HGMA, the GAA. It would really enhance the way our square looks. And all the cities around, you know, surrounding us, like Fort Worth, um, that have taken it to the next level, or South Lake, or there's a um, Frisco, um, they've taken it to the next level, and it just really enhances the city um, and aesthetically, and brings light to our square, which is a beautiful square, and so we need to really celebrate it. So, and also it's a safer option too because we have professionals doing it instead of people that come in 
you know, to support the festivals like myself or my ranch hand that get up in the trees, and it really is not safe. So this would be an option um, from bonded people coming in and placing the lights professionally that look wonderful. So this would be a really great asset if it's approved. And when you redid the square recently, um, and you know, we redid all of that around the square, it's been well, several years, they did run electric electricity to each tree. So it's already there. Okay. These are the four, it's like four trees on the four mm -hmm. corners on the yes. deal. So it'd be 16 trees that are between the pavement and the actual parking lot yes. in the county. That's and correct. I think that's a great idea. I think that would give it a lot of color. Y'all can change it. I like the fact that it's zero cost mm -hmm. to the county. That's a real good idea. Don't you think, Bob Pinnell? I mean, we can't disagree with that, I guess. Y'all sure y'all can't do it cheaper than zero? <laughs> okay. Well, that's real good. Does any commissioner wish to comment? I have a question. I think this is great. I think it's beautiful. I, I think it will enhance the square. Um, how, so you said there's electricity. Is that Hood County provided a city pays city electricity? Pays that. Okay. Yes. So they've agreed. To yes, this as oh, well. Absolutely. Okay, so that was, so I just hey. wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any question or comment? <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, thank Mr. Barry, my predecessor, for bringing this. Uh, I'm honored that he's here and uh, just thank you for bringing this to, to us. Appreciate it. Thank you for sure. Anything else? If not, do I hear an appropriate motion? Yes, I move that we approve to allow the Lake Granbury Area Beautification Council to put lighting at the trees at the courthouse square. Second. Okay, a motion been made by Commissioner Wilson to allow the Lake Granbury Area Beautification Council to put lighting in the trees, the 16 trees surrounding the courthouse. Second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? Okay, all, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed <laughs> say aye. <laughs> See, I was gonna get it one way or another, but it approved <laughs> unanimously 5-0. Thank, Thank all of y'all very, very much, much for doing it. Time, it's a great project. Thank y'all for thinking that up, really. Mr. Barry, did you have anything you want to add to this? No, we're gonna go do an auction for the Salvation Army now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, good. good. All right. Good. Yes, sir. I didn't get a, an open mic for Mike Davis. Mr. Davis, I'll apologize to you, but it's not up here. You know, since we're on the uh, subject of First Amendment and uh, free speech and all that good stuff. You two are the biggest violators of the First Amendment in this whole county. You get all mad and sit there and, and cry and say, well, if you don't fire this person, then, then uh, I'm gonna withhold certain services. Who do you think you are? A little big for your britches, aren't you? You think just because you're elected official that nobody can come here and say this to your face? I'm more than happy to. Think you're untouchable? You're not. You're elected official. You work for me. All right? That's how a republic works. You ever heard whenever the government fears the people we live in a republic where the people fear the government that we live in a tyranny. And you get mad if somebody takes your picture 
You know why you're mad? Because you're doing something wrong. Judge, I want to know why the name is to speak if you didn't turn in a paper. I did turn in a paper. Thank Secondly, you. Secondly, it wasn't up there. Secondly, in time, why is he allowed to raise a commissioner, which is totally against the rules that you said? So open I mic is over. This man open mic is over. He made these rules. Open mic. He made these rules, and now he don't like them because they're being used against him. Hey. Yeah, the agenda started. I mean, I'm sorry, but you're breaking your own rules. Yep. Uh, yep. I have not broken my own rules. Open mic is over. This man did not have a paper. Katie Lang said he had a paper. It's not up here on my desk. She just conveniently forgot to give it to you. Yeah. I didn't do that. Uh huh. Sure. Anyway, so, like I said, what were you doing up there? I got a sneaking suspicion that you were up there. Up there helping Nate Criswell with his little upcoming uh, custody child support hearing. It's probably the reason why you went up there when nobody was up there. So nobody know about it. But hey, I thought he was so good at representing himself and taking it to all those attorneys. Right? You're wrong. You know you're wrong. And that little nervous grin you got speaks, speaks volumes. Keep smiling. You're done in this town. Hope you know that. Your threats are as empty as your house in OTS. All right? We all know the truth. It's like common knowledge in Hood County. Appreciate it. All right. what, a, what a double standard, Judge. Yep. Just, just saying. Okay. The next item is discuss and take appropriate action to allow Mission Granbury to display six-foot ribbons and a clothesline project from April the 3rd to April the 24th, 2023, in recognition of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Mission Granbury was the sponsor of this. And we have Rebecca again. Again. You've done such a good job. And Dusty, is, are you with? OK. They're going to be my sign holder here. Oh, these are sign holders? OK. Great. How are you, Dusty? Good to good. see you. Good to see you. OK. Um, Look at this. We got all the props now. All, all right. Go ahead. So last year, y'all graciously allowed us to do the clothesline project. The, uh, last year was our first year doing the clothesline project. It is a visual display dedicated to raising awareness about the reality of um, about the reality of sexual assault. It is composed of T-shirts created by survivors of sexual assault or in honor of someone who has experienced sexual assault. Each T-shirt is a personal reflection. And last year, we started with eight T-shirts on the clothesline on the square and ended with 26. <coughs> so people from the community saw and felt the need to display their own thoughts or feelings behind sexual assault. Or if they were sexually assaulted, they shared their feelings on T-shirts and displayed them. And for the ones that did not feel comfortable displaying a t-shirt, we let them drop a clothespin. And we ended with 36 clothespins in the bucket from the square. And we also display a six-foot teal sexual assault ribbon on the square as well. We um, do that in front of 1890, so we're asking permission to go ahead and do the clothesline project again this year, along with the ribbon. Turn around and show the audience here what a great job. I remember that. It was very effective. We had a lot of people tell us that Can it's you come up to yeah. the mic, please? A lot of people, when they were eating on the square at, in the evening, would notice young people going up and making their T-shirt because they didn't want to do it in the daylight. So I think it really served a great purpose. It was the first year we did it, and the impact was, was much more than what we expected. Y'all do a great job. I mean, an excellent job. Mission Granbury, as always, helps everybody with anything. So you, 
your name speaks for yourself. Uh, does anybody else, any commissioner, have any question or comment? I do have another thing. Um, oh. So last year we just hung a clothesline um, between like two tea posts and the flower pots. This year we um, are asking if we can do something a little bit more appealing, like a stand with the t-shirts on them. It'll look a little different than it did last year. I think the high school yeah. shop. The high school shop class. Substantial. Okay. So, just we'll wanna make sure that's okay. Different. I think that's a good idea too. You will work with Jay Riley. Y'all have worked with Jay Riley in the past. He is so, he does, yes, he's sure. awesome and helps y'all in any way. Uh, so we will amend the motion here when we get one here to display the six foot ribbons in the clothesline projects with an upgrade on the structure that will hold them. How about that? Correct. Is that good? So do I hear an appropriate motion? I'll make the motion to um allow the Mission Granberry to display a six foot ribbon, ribbons and a updated clothesline structure. apparatus <laughs> structure um, from April 3rd to April 24th, 2023 in recognition of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so a motion has been made by Commissioner Samuelson to allow Mission Granberry to display six foot ribbons and a clothesline project updated uh, structure. structure to <laughs> hold the, the ribbons in, in recognition of Sexual Awareness Month from April the 3rd to April the 24th, 2023, second by Commissioner Wilson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? This motion carries again, 5-0. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the next item is item number three, discuss and take appropriate action to set an amount of no more than $300,000 of the ARP funds to be provided to 501c3 organizations in Hood County and additionally to request the Hood County Department of Emergency Management to develop and submit to Commissioner's Court an application and review process for awarding those funds. I know that we have a bunch, well I say a bunch, we got six people here to give and our first speaker is somebody that nobody in this town will recognize until I call her name. This is Mel Birdwell, would you come up here? Anybody recognize Miss Birdwell here? I have to move the microphone down. <laughs> you don't need to do that. Nobody does. Yeah. Um, good morning. Thank you for letting me be here today. I am Mel Birdwell, and I'm representing the Salvation Army of Hood County. I am 100% hit pitch hitting because they're all at the fashion show having a great time. So um, I'm going to read a lot of what I have. So just bear with me. Um, you do have handouts of all the statistics and the information that goes with um, what our organization does. I'm a member of the Women's Auxiliary and I'm also the volunteer coordinator for this amazing program that we have that is a mentoring program for teens that are in foster care system. Um, I wanna share a little bit with you about how we function um, and to focus on increasing the need for emergency financial assistance. We have seen the community during the past two years during, due to the impact of COVID and request consideration for ARPA funds. From the outset, let me tell you that 100% of the funds that we in the Hood County Salvation Army raise here stays in Hood County. Our president, we've had a presence in Hood County since 1985. I graduated from high school then. Um, our mission is very simple yet profound, to meet human needs without discrimination in the name of Jesus Christ. While the Salvation Army is a national organization, our Extension Unit and Women's Auxiliary are allowed to identify needs and programming at the local level. But with that ability comes responsibility and we are, uh, we are required to uh, provide all necessary funding. Uh, we don't receive any money from the Salvation Army, nor do we send any money to the Salvation Army. Our two primary means of fundraising are the annual Red Kettle Bell that you see us all out there ringing the bell at the at Kroger, H-E-B, Walmart, everywhere. And the spring fundraiser show and auction, which fashion show, which is happening as we speak. That's the reason I'm here and not somebody smarter than me. Um, so why are we here today? 
Um, I don't think any nonprofit here could have predicted the financial storm that has occurred in the past two years and the impact that it's had on providing services. There are four major areas that the Salvation Army serves. Their disaster response, mentoring foster teens, auxiliary community projects, and the focus for today is emergency financial assistance. We serve Hood County residents from our office in, on North Baker Street. We have one part-time paid caseworker who along with volunteers, we have over 200 volunteers here in Hood, Hood County that are active, staff the office, do the casework, qualify people, and pr help provide assistance. Our pro programming goals include preventing eviction and homelessness, and to help meet the basic needs for a home, such as rent, water, gas, and electricity. Additionally, we provide some financial assistance to help with medical and dental care. Um, it's also important to know that any resident of Hood County can seek assistance. However, we at the Salvation Army have reached a crisis point. Since COVID in the last two years, our client visits have quadrupled. The impact of COVID has de devastated many Hood County residents. Uh, the budget year 21-22, we planned for $60,000 of assistance in our county. Uh, last summer, we hit consecutive months of assistance of over $10,000, peaking in August at $17,400 in just one month. For the first time, like many other nonprofits, we have had to say people, we are out of funds and we can't help you this month. For our 22-23 budget year, we directed more money to fund emergency assistance and we increased that to $90,000, which is a 50% increase on what we are able to do. Uh, given inflation, increasing rent, utility, and food costs, more people are coming, and we are running out of money at se about $7,500 a month and still having to turn away clients. We are incredibly thankful for community partners, especially Mission Granberry and various churches that we work with to create a solution to piece together some sort of assistance, but we can serve many more people if we had the funds to get through these difficult economic times. Any additional funds would be appreciated, and 100%, as always happens with the Salvation Army, will stay to, with residents in Hood County. Uh, thank you in advance for your consideration. Um, I know you want to give us a lot of money, so if that would be great. We would appreciate it. I'm kidding. Um, just seriously, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here today. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. There's tons of information in that packet that I gave you. Good. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. It's very welcome. informative. Does anyone? Have any questions or comments to Ms. Birdwell? I think you covered all your bases. Okay. But if you have anything else, go ahead. Just uh, my mother-in-law passed away last night, so I have to, to go. So I just didn't want to right. be, think I was being rude and just do my part in leaving. So thank okay. you all. Sorry for your loss. Thank you. Okay. Next is Kathy Offit. Good morning, Judge Maskell and Commissioners. Uh, as, you, as you spoke, I'm Katie Off at Forward Training Center Executive Director. Um, we are so blessed in Granbury. Um, I came here today uh, to talk about um, the nonprofits receiving more funds, requesting that for the community, um, for the county. Uh, Granbury is blessed to have a very well organized um, agencies here and we all support them. Uh, you may not know so much about Forward Training Center. We're a little smaller and maybe a little newer. Um, we're uniquely different than other nonprofits. Uh, we're a standalone educational campus where we're committed to break the generational cycle of poverty. Um, we are des are, we're designed with that in mind in everything we do to uh, empower men and women to understand their value and that they have an opportunity uh, when they're, we set that in a loving uh, environment where they can actually find their skills and talents, find meaningful work in the ways that they are, can flourish and grow. Um, our program is a two month, our core program, we have other things, but the main one, two months we s sit with our students. They have a mentor beside them where they are um, de learning to develop a work ethic uh, foundational principles of um, finding a job. Um, it's a step by step, and over two months you can see how that would just unfold into a very 
um, a systematic way where they can begin to learn to believe in themselves again, uh, whatever is come, going on. But then that we need to teach them not only internally how to feel confident about themselves, but then we need to help them learn how to do resumes, mock interviews, uh, prepare for the workforce. And that's what we do for Hood County. We are putting people to work. They're finding jobs. Uh, business owners here in town come in and do the mock interviews with with the students so that they're really prepared to really get those jobs. Additional uh, uh, programs we offer are Microsoft Office Suite, QuickBooks. We have a Cisco Networking Academy certification program. Ways for them to actually get the skills to get right into the workplace. And so we know that finding meaningful work um, that, um, that you're uh, really does affect the family. People that produce their own income by the hand by their own hand, um, it, it just um, it passes on down to the families and the next generation. We've uh, begun to work with uh, GISD, with the STARS Accelerated School, and also Premier School for the youth programs now uh, in the city, impacting at that impressionable age of the work ethic and how to um, succeed. Uh, funding in the, uh, the, from the county would um, give us an opportunity to expand to some satellites. We'd like to look into the different areas of the community and have different um, areas where, so we could serve a larger um, populace. Um, we are about long-term sustainability. Um, we do give a hand up and then we stay with them so they can stay up and pretty soon that money that was used for them to support them maybe from other agencies or uh, is freed for other people in need they become self-sufficient. And I would like to request that the uh, county increase the allotment to all the nonprofits uh, that was uh, mentioned. And then we would like to request that um, you would consider that we are very small and have very limited opportunities, um, except through our fundraisers, um, that perhaps you might look at us for $100,000 to help us achieve these goals. Um, when people um, uh, work by their own hand uh, and believe in themselves, the community can be restored and dignity um, and purpose can be found for hope for their futures. Thank you. That's very good. That's very good. Uh, anybody have any questions? I do. Ms. Moffitt, did you, when you were going over all the things that you're doing, um, did you mention GED program or do you, do you provide the GED program or? We uh, did an independent school district. Uh, provides the ESL and the GED program for a forward training center. Recently, they've uh, changed the GED uh, program. They're doing some reevaluating re of that. So, but the ESL is still very strong in our, uh, but we, uh, that's from Denton Independent School District. Oh, so it's we, not, we it's not part of your, it's not part of your program or it is? It's, we offer it uh, to our building and it is part of, what we have for the community there in the building, yes. At this time, though, the GED program, uh, the Denton Independent School District uh, has made some changes. So we are, it doesn't really, it doesn't have anything to do with me. It's not happening at the current time, is what you're saying? It's just recently, okay. they've decided to make some changes, yes. Okay. But the uh, ESL, we have all, over 100 students enrolled or uh, thereabouts, and, and we've expanded that with two different levels, entry level, and then also uh, the um, you know beginning and then advanced English as second language. We're getting a lot of people coming in from Ukraine and other places. That's wonderfully uh, done. Yes, thank you. Well, it was Denton County that made the changes in the GED program. Yes. Not forward training. No. Right. That's what I understood. Is Denton County going to, when they make the changes, come back and use the space that forward training has allowed them to use for the GED program? We still have an MOU with them, uh, and it's just, uh, we still have sp uh, the building available, so when they, uh, I really don't know yet, uh, right now what they're going to do, but they're looking into the, all the possibilities. So. But of course, forward training is going to back them if they want to. Of course, do of course. That's what I'm saying. Oh, of course, yes. And y'all had nothing to do with Denton County stopping the GED program right now. It's their decision. Uh, we provide space if they, uh, you know, we have a place for the GED program, and then, um, but beyond that, anything they change, if they have a right to do that. Thank you. Thank you very so. much. 
And I do, I would want to say that recently that has come up and I was told by the Denton Independent School District that if anybody had any questions, please contact them and they're taking care of all the details with the students that were affected and everything. And so I fully have confidence in them to take care of that in a very um, efficient way. Good. So the students yeah. that were in the program that did complete can call the Denton Independent School District and find out how they can assist them. Yes. Thank you very much. I appreciate your coming down yeah, here. Yeah. So thank okay. you very much. Thank Anybody you, else have any questions? Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Offit. All right. Next is Jeannie McGregor. Ms. Mack. much. Thank you, ma'am. This is in regard to the ARP funds. Last week, the GED program monitored and provided by Denton ISD with local partner Florida Training Center was closed down with little or no consideration for the students of Hood County. Their mistake is our gain. We can take this opportunity, build on it, and make Hood County uniquely different. I'm a bottom line person, a realist. I'm here to petition you for financial support from the American Rescue Fund to build a program that will be unlike any other. The program is entitled Overcomers and Beyonders, Beyonders for short. It will include individualized training for the GED, the ASVAB military entrance test, and the TSI, the community college entrance test. It will also include Smart Start, which is built around individualized accelerated mastery of math mathematics for young children ages 3 to 10. It will also include a consulting element for grandparents and parents who need a resource to address specific learning needs. It is a program that can help solve academic problems, no matter if the student is a homeschooler or in a private school or public school. It is a program that will not compete, but provide a unique and highly successful partnership in learning logistics. My name is Ms. Mack, Janine McGregor. I've been a resident of Hood County for over seven years. During my second year here, I was given the respected title of Hood County Teacher of the Year. My brochure lists other awards over the years, and there is a scientific reason behind them, along with parents and students who love learning. From the age of four, I wanted to be a pediatrician. I graduated from college with a pre-med degree, but instead of attending medical school, I conducted research for one. Then through unexpected turns, I took that unique experience and applied it to the field of education. Neurocognitive development is a passion of mine. Efficiency learning, learning logistics is my goal. My research aided me in teaching an 11-month-old child how to read, something that at least 10% of Hood County infants could do given the chance. I established and ran a learning lab a school for 12 years, producing students who scored in the top 5% in the nation. Students who were often cast aside because of learning differences. I came to Hood County with semi-retirement in mind, but I had one last group to study, adult learners. So for four and a half years, I have served Hood County adults in that position. I have gained insight and little known information about what truly affects adult education and because of that research I have been through divine intervention and I do not say that lightly, the privilege of standing here before you today. I have been advised to seek partnerships with private businesses, with humanitarians, public and private academic institutions and non-profit organizations to further my endeavors. But each have unique entanglements that cannot live up to your unique position. Remember that currently stranded GED students, that is a byproduct of entanglements. You, the county commissioners, have the cleanest non-bureaucratic umbrella for potential services for more local residents than any other entity. I believe that local control by seasoned strategists makes sense. Therefore, I'm here to ask for a position, a job, to serve your community, my community, by designing and implementing a program uniquely only to this county, this state. With the right support, these services can be extended to meet the needs of more residents. 
I and my staff would be directly accountable to you, you who in turn are directly accountable to our taxpayers, our neighbors, a local service provided by local leaders for local people. Research shows that 28% of rural counties have a department similar to what I am suggesting. But I guarantee you, if one does come to fruition here, it will be by a, by a leading example, not a rubber stamped one. Hire me for six months as a founder, teacher of this pilot program, the Beyonders of Hood County. COVID is only one reason for our academic setbacks, but the recovery funds can be springboard to start something unique. We will not only rebound, but excel given the chance. At the end of six months, you will have firsthand knowledge of efficiency and effectiveness. Then I hope you will consider making it a permanent service which can easily grow to serve more Hood County citizens, including the people from Toler and Lapan. If you had the specifics, you have the specifics with itemized budget before you. Two night sessions each week to address GED, ASVAB, and TSI students. Two day sessions each week to empower parents, grandparents, and students with higher and unusual academic success. With the help of a few civic-minded people, I was able to restore GED class last night. Love my students. Four are taking GED student tests this weekend. Until funding arises, I will carry the load, but I need help. Please help me build Beyonders. Thank you for your time and consideration. Are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> so do you feel like you've got pretty good community support for what you're trying to do. Uh, may I ask the ones in the back of the room who have an interest or an interest to please stand, have any involvement in the GED or Beyonders program? Yes, sir, I do. And may I have Andrew be pointed out who's standing over here, he's your number five case in the handout that you have. Andrew uh, uh, completed as a second grader 137 independent studies on his own in addition to regular class room. He completed two years of math ahead of schedule as a second grader working on seventh, uh, fifth grade math. Right, Andrew? Great math student that we have. Uh, it works. It works very well. Uh, I, I do have a question. Yes, sir. Well, yes, ma'am. <laughs> why is this not part of the tax dollars that residents pay for school taxes? And why is it not part of the ISD? Well, every one of those entities are bureaucratic in nature. So even though that I have given this idea, and you've got my hand out there, to a number of schools, I've talked to a number of agencies over the years, there's always an entanglement. Somebody either wants control, either personal or private. It's just not very efficient mm -hmm. at all. So what I'm trying to do is empower the individual, to empower them and turn them loose so that they can move forward in doing it. So when you ask a question like that, bureaucracy plays into it a lot. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we make it simple, if we make it simple and empower directly our citizens, then I think we'll shine beyond any other county. Yeah, I think what you're doing is, you know, you've obviously got examples of where people have gone well beyond what they thought they could do. I'm, I'm just not quite drawing the line between why this isn't part of the educational program that we have in It's been a part of the educational system, the but very district. inefficiently. Okay. Tell me, what kind of money do you think that you need to really get your program? You have a line-by-line -line item budget. The first page and your last page of your handout tells that and uh, all of the items that I've listed there. I hope that I haven't overlooked anything. Okay. It's in front of you. Well, we have a county library here that the, the taxpayers pay for. Uh, do you, have you worked or talked to the library at all or what, yeah, you that's great. Cookie Hunt, is she here? Yes. Cookie? Yes. She's right there. Cookie and I come spoke. Up, come up to the mic, please. <coughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, we spoke recently, and um, Jennifer and I have spoken as well, but we need more information. We would like to do something to help. Um, and. 
in answer to your question about why the school district isn't doing it, and, and I hope I'm not stepping out of bounds here, but you should really ask the school board about that. Why are they not providing such a program? Um, I know myself, I taught GED classes when I was in Colorado. Um, I taught English. And to Katie, I, I worked here. I did the ESL program. I mean, I'm pretty much aware of what's going on educationally. And the library would like to do whatever we can. We just need a little bit more information. But I do think the school board should also address that problem. Thank you, Cookie. Okay. I hope with Cookie that we can start a program from ages three to five so that they can be advanced in math by the time they go into school. And we're going to do it in a very creative way, hopefully. Thank you. I would like for you to schedule an appointment with me in my office next week so that we could discuss that. I think Jerry there at Earth. That was another problem in this county. A unique problem in this county is the fact that you've got so many homeschoolers with kids that are advanced that finish their high school education by the age of 16 in the state of Texas. They cannot take the GED, which some of them need to move on to the next step unless they get a court order. Well, these people do not have lawyer pocketbooks here to come before. And most judges, I think, have to make that motion, am I not correct, only if it's, they are a probationary or a child at risk. I would like to see that service moved over just for those kids that are bright and moving ahead. Well, we're going to research that because I would certainly like to address that and I would certainly hear that and I would certainly sign something for an advanced student to go up be to continue their, take the GED and then continue on with their education. May I, may I please read the, the case study number one to you? You'll yeah, find, please, is please. that all right? Thank you, Cookie. Because this affects you. This, is, this was a, an unusual case, but it seems like I run into unusual cases quite often. And then I thought the audience would like to hear about this, about the spunk that some of our people in our community have. Melissa was a cook in her 50s at ju the juvenile center here at Hood County, and she had a hard time during COVID. Because no one would work, she worked double shifts. She constantly, consistently came to class late at night, exhausted after work. Survived cancer surgery two times during her studies. She completed three out of the five GED tests before Texas dropped the provider and erased her accomplishments and made her start all over again to get her GED. And she took care of a family member with health issues. I talked to her this week. She obtained her GED in December of 2021. She needs to be commended for that. I have one that's not a Hood County uh, individual, case number f uh, four. She's a GED student, 52 years of age, Stacy. She works out of Hamilton. She lives in Hamilton, Texas, and put two kids through college. She returned to the academic world to become a nurse, and she started coming, getting up at four in the morning from Hamilton, Texas, driving to Abilene, Texas, working a shift there with the death, uh, dying people through hospice, drives two hours to Granbury, because they don't have a program out there, attends her GED instruction for three hours, returns home to Hamilton, to take care of an elderly parent and dealt with her husband, husband's new discovered cancer care and treatment. She refused financial support from an independent donor out of our community. She completed her GND, G GED this December 22 and now she's coming to us to continue her TSI. So she needs to be commended too. There are great people out there that have the spunk for this and I would like to open the door to them, and again, you're the only entity, and I've done research on this, they're the only entity that has that umbrella to, to affect that many people. Thank you very much. I, I got. I had another question, Ms. Mack. <laughs> Just, were you, were you in midstream with some students when, for whatever reason, I don't want to get into that, but you're not 
housed over at Forward Training Center anymore, right? I'm currently still a employee of Denton ISD Adult Education System, but they have not told me or answered my emails as to what will happen to this program. I will tell you that on more than one occasion, they have had our Hood County students have to drive to Cleburne to register when they're living from paycheck to paycheck to register to come back to take the GED with me. And I've ask over and over, please let it be a local thing. So Denton ISD adult program, even though they have great things and they're funded through the state through that federal funding, they are not really in tune to our students here in Hood County. It's an out county situation. So I'm hoping to bring this locally. And there are a lot of programs that are handled locally and not through that particular program. As far as my relationship with Denton ISD at this time, I have no idea. They haven't told me anything at all. So I just asked the students, what do you want to do? So that's why we met last night, started our classes. Boom. And I think I gave you an impact statement from one of our students. Golly, I wish you could read that one. Yeah, he wants to stay here and become a law enforcement person. He is incredible as far as his studies go. Yeah, I th in fact, I think I'm going to, with the court's indulgence, I'm going to read this. Uh, my name is Pablo, and I'm a new student of the GED program, and I was referred to this program by my wife, who had gotten her GED from the same program, and she is now uh, nursing, student. nursing her, going to school for nursing. Uh, and she asked me to get mine GED as well. So I'm a young father with two beautiful children, and I want to do better for them. I'm getting my GED so I can pursue my dream job in law enforcement. I want to work for Granbury because it is the town I call home and grew up in. I want to help people on, my, on a bigger scale and give back to the community. So this GED is very important to me for it will make or break my future of doing what I want to do in my life. So I beg you, please, help keep this program going. It is helping people get their life on track and accomplish what they want to do, signed Pablo. Thank you for reading that. Oh, okay. Excellent. So Denton ISD is providing GED services, but Granberry ISD is not. Am I? Correct on that? Denton ISD is under, uh, gets a grant. The, the, the state of Texas gets a grant, federal money for grant for a, a workforce. I think this was under Bush, uh, Workforce Solutions to do this. The money is then dispersed to providers, and usually they are ISDs that add on an adult education system. Okay. okay. We don't have one here. Uh, Denton ISD took this uh, on, and then it's, it covers Denton and Johnson County and Hood County. Uh, and so we are an outlying county from their uh, funding, basically. Okay. So from a grant that they receive from the From a grant from that state. has to be renewed, yes. Okay. Let me share. Thank you. Thank you. Any Thank other questions? you very much Thank for you. bringing this to our attention. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next speaker is Brady Overstreet. Good morning, Judge, Commissioners. My name is Brady Overstreet. I'm at uh, 6500 Sonora Drive in De Cordova. And um, I'm a volunteer with uh, Rancho Brazos, but I'm really here to speak on behalf of um, all nonprofit organizations. Um, when I was looking at this agenda on item number three, um, I, I do need clarification on what this exactly means. So discuss and take appropriate action to set an amount of no more than $300,000 of the ARPA funds to be provided to 501c3 organizations in Hood County. So does that mean that of the $5.6 million of federal funds that this proposal is only to set aside $300,000 in total to nonprofit organizations? That was the intent. Of course, there's always 
motions that can be amended, but I wanted to put something on there to get us uh, started. As you may not be aware that on the first tranche of ARPA funds, there was 1.3 million that was um, set aside for several charities. So yes, um, there was, you know, we, I guess, well, I have something I'd like to say, but I can wait till you're finished and to understand why this is on the agenda and where we're, what my intent was. Oh, okay. So I was just, um, I was concerned that only 5.4% of that money may be going to nonprofit organizations because we have more than 30 nonprofit organizations in Hood County alone. And um, there's so many, with this growing community, there's such a growing need. Um, I, I think so many of the other speakers that have already been here today um, have noted. And, um, and not only that, but um, nonprofit organizations is one, one avenue for this money uh, to be divvied out, but also those nonprofit organizations can also help in the other following categories like public health, assistance to households, possibly assistance to small businesses. Now, if there's any small businesses that still need money that are alive today due to the COVID um, impact, I would, I would venture to say that they're probably not around anymore as a small business owner myself. And um, also, you know, a, a public sector capacity. Um, I, I don't think there's anything greater than, than allowing the private sector in these nonprofit organizations to be able to, that are embedded into this community, to be able to, to use those funds and see how they, they're so fit. So, you know, whether it be these people are, are seeing the needs of the community on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's, that's all I ask, that if this was $300,000 total that, that I ask the court to raise that, that allotment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sherry Bernheit? Bernhardt. Bernhardt. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have to lower this. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for letting me address you today. Uh, my name is Sherry Bernhoff. I'm the uh, current board president for the Hood County United Way. Uh, Crystal Moore, who is our executive director, is also at the Salvation Army event today as well. Our mission for the Hood County United Way is to help identify community needs and work with all of the nonprofits across our community to help them meet these unaddressed and unmet needs. Uh, similar to what you heard with the Salvation Army, 100% of the money that we raise here in Hood County stays in Hood County. Um, this is a great community. I've lived here for 17 years. Uh, my, my family, my husband's family has been here since the 1980s. We love Hood County. It's a great place to raise a family. But unfortunately, we have a lot of unmet needs that I'm sure you're aware of, but we still need to keep lifting up to all the other members in our community. Um, and a lot of these needs that have been identified are still unmet and were exacerbated by the COVID situation. And we really need to move forward. We want to put this situation behind us. Um, so for example, some of the unmet needs that we've really seen exacerbated by COVID are the access to affordable housing, uh, feeding the community, the education needs that have set back our community, um, mental illness, substance abuse, physical abuse. Those were all exacerbated by the COVID. And those needs, they still are out there today. The only way we're going to address those is to come together as a community to, and work on those. It's going to take the hard work and the dedication of many of the people that you've already heard from today. But it's also going to take money. Another impact of the COVID is we have seen our funding decrease drastically. 
If I look at United Way worldwide, they recently put out a publication. United Way's main source of funding used to come from workplace giving. Internationally, workplace giving during the COVID dropped 62%. What that we've, we've seen, I can't give you the exact number for Hood County. We're somewhat delayed in collecting our money from the um, major donors, the workplace campaigns, but we have seen a significant impact. What that does is it significantly impacts the money that the United Way Hood County can allocate out to all of our partner agencies, like, the, like Rancho Brazos like Forward Training Center. We have been curtailed and had to have cut back our allocations. So we definitely support having the process that you're proposing, but similar to the last speaker, we really ask that the funding that's set aside be allowed to address the needs of the community. Uh, we will continue to support the other nonprofits with their specific request. As a United Way, we don't deal with uh, giving out day-to-day -day needs, but we look to try and strategically partner across the community to address some of the longer-term sustainability needs. One of those is, is we would like to put together a community hub for all the nonprofits to co-locate, to join together in providing these services. It's very early in the process. We're working with GISD, we're working with the city of Granbury, and we would love to work with all of you on making this co-located central hubs for the nonprofits, um, a reality. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions, comments? Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. Okay, next speaker is Tina Brown. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm also um, a little confused about the 300,000 that you want to set aside. I wish that y'all would have discussed this before you opened it up to us so we'd have a little more clear understanding of what this is. We have $5.6 million to spend in three years or allocate in three years. 300,000 seems a drop in the bucket. The only person at that um, workshop was from Rancho Brazos where they lost $350,000 this year in funding. So can you explain um, like what percentage are you planning on doing this for, for 5013, how much percentage, I mean, can you, explain that uh, were you planning on explaining it after we spoke well, I, w I wish you would have spoke beforehand so I could ask questions yes okay. Yes, you can. okay so um, I put this on the agenda as a follow-up from the workshop that you were at on on March 1st as members of the court and the community discuss the possible uses of the 5.7 million remaining in the American Rescue Plan Act funds among other uses such as the volunteer fire department, the EMSs, wastewater possibilities. There was also a discussion on various charities. I recall that during the early days of the ARPA uh, funds that there was a discussion in this court and a commitment uh, to m put in place a robust application process as well as an audit process for how those funds are received, how those who receive the funds, how those funds are being used. After talking to a few people involved in 5013C charities, providing financial statements, uh, board of directors, uh, registration with the uh, Secretary of State, bylaws, etc. That is not out of the ordinary for any grant that a 5013C would apply for. Also in the discussion with various charities, there was some fear that they would see their donations from the public go down if they thought the county government was taking care of their needs. So that's a concern that we also need to think of. So um, also, as just to restate again, in the, in the first uh, tranche or funds that were provided by uh, the, the taxpayer funds from the federal government, 1.3 million was provided to several charities um, throughout Hood County. And remember that we also, uh, the, the county also 
purchased a $330,000 bookmobile that's being used by the library, or will be as soon as it's here. And also, the county also provides the building that is used by the YMCA for basically no cost. So there, there, there is a lot of uh, charitable giving that the county is already doing. So knowing that the county has some big infrastructure items ahead of us with the volunteer fire department and the EMS, um, possible wastewater, and those are big ticket items that will provide ongoing services to the entire county, I just thought it would be a good idea to put this on the agenda for us to um, get some more input and discuss, and that's why I put it on the agenda. So um, the 300000 was to put on there as a point of discussion. Um, does it need to be more? Does it need to be less, considering all the other things that we have going on in the, um, the way the county is already providing for charities so that's why I put it on there. So I don't, I don't know, want to hear from the other commissioners or the judge? Well, I can say this, is that, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong on this up there, I think Margaret Campbell's here, but I do not think that Salvation Army forward training and uh, Rancho Brazos received any of the initial money no. that we gave the 1.3 to. Am I correct on that? That's correct. Okay, so definitely when we look at all these charities, it's the feeding and the rent and the health. There's a lot of things that we have to give this county here. And like Mr. Overstreet brought out, 5.4% of what's remaining, in my humble opinion, is not nearly enough. We've got these people out here like United Way that can help with this. We didn't give anything to United Way either, did we? And all this stuff, when it stays in Hood County for Hood County residents and what the good that these are doing, like I said, forward training, Salvation Army, this beyond a, approach here, I'm really interested in that program and want to see what I can do to assist in that way. I mean, I'm like you. $300,000 is not near enough. And, Excuse me for saying this, but you're famous for if it's budgeted, you don't want to get outside the budget. Exactly. Well, I'm here. So, 300,000, I think, when we hear from Rancho Brazos and what they lost, in my opinion, they may be entitled to the full $300,000 and we didn't even touch the rest of these 501c3 and the counties of which there's 30 of them. That's what the money was really put here for. And so when you say wastewater, we don't have any wastewater projects going here. We, we could. We talked about it at the, um, at the workshop, remember? We did. And Commissioner Eagle says that unless the city of Granbury wants to partner with us or work with us on this thing, that there's no way that we can work together. I haven't we have heard anything. I've asked around to see if the city is wanting to go into a regional wastewater system. And I was told they had no interest. Oh, in I was told the opposite, and we have it on the agenda for next week at the joint meeting. Oh, good. Well, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll find out then. And I also heard it's $250 million for a regional wastewater pattern. What did you get the cost of? Did you I haven't gotten a cost yet, but so you might ask one of the other commissioners that's been more involved. Ms. Eagle, do you know what the total cost of a regional wastewater system would be? Well, it depends on the size, how many how many gallons a day. It's There's a lot of factors involved in that, so uh, without having details, it's going to be hard to sit up here and, and to, to come up with an exact number, but it's something to be explored. Yes. And uh, so, but that's not on the agenda for today as far as that's concerned. Right. So, so I just talking want... about this money here about right. when she mentioned wastewater, I wrote down wastewater here and it is connected with the five point seven million, but I hear that regional waste point, we're talking about a couple of hundred million dollars for a regional waste point. Am I way off base here? I think I think that's way off, but that's we can uh, like I said uh, find out about that. Just as a correction on Rancho Brazos, I um followed up on that because I, 
I made a commitment during the um, workshop to get in touch with Hood County News and ask them to do a feature article on Rancho Brazos as I thought that the community, there would be an outpouring of support if they were, if the community was aware that the funding had right. been removed. And I also contacted the Methodist Church to ask, you know, what what was going on. And actually, there is still quite a bit of funding coming from the United Methodist Church after talking to the finance department. They didn't lose their entire funding. So there's about 192,000 of their 390 that is being set aside for the uh, Rancho Brazos. So just keep that in mind that it's, uh, they're still supporting it, but they're... Um, Who did you speak to? It was the finance person at the United Methodist Church. And there's only one person? Yes. There? Okay. Okay, but I'm still concerned about how, is this, a, is this for this fiscal year? Is what we're talking about? This fiscal year, 300,000? Shouldn't we be talking about how we're gonna spend one third since we only have three years to spend this money or allocate well, it? That's why we had the workshop to talk about all of the things that need to be addressed in the county and what this, and uh, Margaret can probably jump in here and say that there's a limited amount of things that the ARPA funds can be used for based on the regulations. So that's why we had the workshop to discuss those things, so. Yeah, you know, once, so for instance, we got radios that we've been able to uh, dovetail into the, some of this ARPA money. And of course, the wastewater is an issue that can be looked at, infrastructure issues, uh, stormwater. I know there's some stormwater issues and more in some precincts than others. Also, the old Granberry Road, uh, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to be talking about this next week at the city, uh, at the joint meeting about what we're going to do to try to get people around 377 when they start uh, breaking that down. And so there's infrastructure issues that the ARPA money can be used for that helps ease the burden off the taxpayers. The taxpayers uh, ad valorem taxes. So there's, uh, there's a lot of, there's this much money and this many uses oh, for it. Oh, yeah. But how, how you know, like what kind of percentage are we talking about infrastructure? What kind of percentage are we talking about 501k, 501c3s? You know, what's the, what's the breakdown? I mean, what are y'all's thoughts? I mean, we have so many people that are, you know, hurting right now. So I don't know about. Sounds like we need another workshop. That's Just fine with me. I'm opposed to setting 5.4% of the budget. I mean, I thought we should be talking about one third of this, what's left yeah. to spend this year or al at least allocate one third, not 300,000. I'm, I'm just. Yeah. Well, we, I, I, we, got, you know, we put three million dollars just into radios. We got volunteer fire departments that we're we've been working hard to upgrade and up, you know, put more money into the volunteer fire departments for the last three years. So it's uh, there's like I said, there's lots of needs that are long reaching, mm -hmm. and the 501 C3s. This is kind of a one time fix, and they're still going to be back where they were. So we have to look at, you know, we have to look at the whole picture for sure. Right. Right. Uh, Jeff and Sheriff, aren't the radios already paid for out of the first sum of money? We've been paying in increments as they milestones, is what they call it. In the milestones, and that's already allocated from the previous ARPA money, am I right? Yes, that's kind of the first deposit. The so first radios deposit. have nothing to do with the remaining 5.6 million, am I right? Correct. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm just trying to get. It just, well, I think we definitely need another workshop. Maybe take so. Take all these things. <laughs> and look at all these needs. I do. Because I like so. only one nonprofit showed up at that, and you know a couple more showed up here, and you know there's a lot of them that probably didn't know they needed to show up and say, hey, don't forget me. So. <laughs> so there's yes. Okay. All right. So Thank there you. are. Remember that we do have that assessment from the you know, the fire stations, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done on, with our volunteer fire department. And like we said in the workshop, that could take the entire 5.7 million just to work, you know, get the, um, the volunteer fire departments to where they need to be. So we need to keep that in mind. That's our job is to, you know, make sure that we're being financially astute to what the county's needs are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker.
Our last speaker is Sharla Cairo. I know this lady. You happen to know her, Commissioner mm -hmm. Wilson? Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. First, I would like to say thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to come back and speak before all of you. I'd especially like to thank Commissioner uh, Samuelson uh, for just looking into Rancho and all things Rancho. Again, I live to all of you. The best way to learn about Rancho is to come visit and see what we're doing out there. I do have a, an email uh, that was sent to me by our treasurer following up on his conversation with Ms. Samuelson and it said, things I did not share with her but we probably should share for a better understanding. AUMC stopped their original monthly grant which was $37,000 a month. That loss of funding was effective January 1st. For benevolence in January, we received zero dollars uh, to assist with utilities, uh, health needs, et cetera, from the church. In, Jan in February, we received $1,000 the second week of February. In March, we received $1,500 on March the 10th. So we had one third of the month gone before funding even came. And when funding goes from 5,000 monthly for utility assistance to waiting for the check to come in the mail, it makes it more difficult to plan how and who we will serve. In addition, the 72,000 in maintenance and utilities from the church included that benevolence, and we're waiting month by month for that now. In addition, seeking new funding resources while we were planning our budget, we were notified by Tarrant Area Food Bank, a mobile pantry service that we, we brought into the community during COVID when we pivoted from after school to meeting daily health needs. That has now increased from free to 19 cents a pound. That will take place April 1st. So we will be paying three to five dollars a car load for the 150 families that we're serving in that one day. That's a problem. I'd also like to say that in the 10 years that I have been there, we have served 1,079 children in after school. That is no other way, just after school. We now have a waiting list for second grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade because half of our building is still a pantry and hygiene because those needs have never went away. So that means that we have more kids home without supervision, latchkey, than we did three years ago. Along with still operating Rancho Monday through Friday with after school programming, nutrition, uh, being sure that every student has their needs met educationally, we are also trying to develop that 4.6 acres of land that we released last year. The goal in developing that land is those outdoor gardens. The to foster relationships with kids that would not be able to participate in FFA and 4-H. Long term, what we're trying to do at Rancho Brazos Community Centers is break dysfunction, generational dysfunction. Uh, when we were at that meeting at the EOC, there was a lot of conversations about the jail. So it caused me to go back and look. Out of the one th over 1,000 students that we've served, we have buried two. We have seen three go to prison, and we've lost five to the foster care system. Overall, those are good numbers, but I'm not happy with them. My vision for the development of the land is to lessen a lot of the criminal activity, to teach the children from a younger age, and to break those generational cycles. Uh, primarily, we do that preventative education through our parent cafes and our partnership with Cook Children's, with, uh, through nutrition with our partnership with Terranary Food Bank and, and everyone around Hood County. When we hear that African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, that is more true today than ever before. And quite frankly, y'all are the village. And so are all of they. 
it takes all of us to make that change. So when we're hearing battles about uh, build a jail and how big, in my mind, what I'm thinking is yes, we need it. But in addition to that, I'm thinking how do we stop that question again in 20 years? And the best way I can come up with is time. Pouring into our young people, educating our young people, and loving them. And lastly, I'd like to say, all of us are sisters in nonprofit. None of us want to compete against one another for funding. We prefer to complement one another and work together. And I really hope that all of you take that into consideration. And lastly, I lift again, I would love to give each and every one of you a tour behind the square from our perspective. Thank you. I just want to say one thing. When you, and when you go out there, I don't know if you want to ride with Sharla and her bus. It is rather hair raising. It's either that or go to Six Flags. It's about the same thing and <laughs> ride that roller coaster. She will get you around. We didn't run over anybody or into anything, but it was an eye opening experience. So if you can go up there, she more than they'll take you around and show you what they've been dealing with and it's quite remarkable. It really is. So as I understand it right now, the most that you've gotten since the first of the year from Acton Methodist Church is $2,500? Now, they've pledged 10000 monthly to go towards salaries so long as they can afford it. Oh. That decision was made in December. The church has had a second vote and had another mass exodus. So soon the time will come, frankly, respectfully, where they're not going to be able to fund those salaries. And those salaries, there were 15 employees in December. Eight of them were released to Rancho to the tune of $240,000. They've, they've committed $10,000 a month they have as, as their tithing as towards that. Yes, as so long as they're able to afford it, and those were Don Steen's words that you spoke with at the church. So long as they can afford it, they will send it. So did the Hood County News contact you to do a feature article? Yes, Ms. Cruz did contact us, and our, our board speaker has been handling some medical things and is going to be following back up with her. Okay. So thank you. I just think, you know, the community, we live in such a great benevolent community that if people knew the difficulties that are that the church is going through and how that's impacting you that there would be an outpouring of support because of all the good work that you do that you know it's a great place thank, thank you, you for doing that thank you well i say my name is charlotte carroll and i love where i live and there's no better place to invest than where we sleep shop pray and pay taxes mm -hmm. thank you thank you thank you both thank you thank you Any more comments? Does any commissioner have any question or comment regarding number three? In regards to Rancho Brazos, uh, I would basically challenge anybody that questions the validity of what they do and what they're able to accomplish with the minimal amount of funds that they have. Go out and spend a couple of hours out there. You'll find out real quick, you know, the good that they're doing there. So, you know, if you question that, you know, there's, there's an open door for you to go see. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Can I just say something? Yes. I'm not come, on the come on. You have to come up here, Dusty, and straight from them. Thank you. I just want to say that there's a lot of good work that goes on in this community that a lot of people don't know about. Um, and I read a quote late recently that said, um, we have to stop just pulling them out of the river. We need to go find out why they're falling in. And that's really what we're all doing. But a lot of people, uh, and I'm not saying you're not seeing it, I'm just saying that we do a lot of work and you don't know we're there. And all these nonprofits that have been talking today, we work with all of them. I'm with Mission Granberry, and we work with all of them. We work super close with Sharla, super close with Salvation Army, and we couldn't do what we do without them. So um, with all due respect, if we can fund those of us that are trying to keep people out of the jail, 
and um, I'm, I'm all for the fire departments. Trust me, I know that has to be done. But we really have to start helping people have better places to live and have a better way to make a living in Hood County. So I, I would just implore you to think about that when you, when you try to designate these funds. Charlotte's working really hard and, and she didn't even have a shoestring, really. So just think about that. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any comment, questions? If not, do I hear a motion? Uh, hang on, Judge. <clears throat> I am grieved in my soul right now. My stomach is turning and twisting, and I am, I am a miserable fella right this second. I, to think of taking, and this is in essence tax money, these are, these are such worthy causes. These are such good things going on here. But I don't know if it can be incumbent on your government to take tax money to, to confiscate that from someone to give to a good cause. And I'm, I'm, I am hurting on the inside right now, uh, trying to figure out where to come down on this. That's that's all I wanted to say. That's a. I understand. If, you, if you're if you're of the faith, please pray for me to get some peace on this because this is this is seriously. I am struggling very mightily with this issue. I'm I'm have the same struggles because you know I feel like people in the the county are very benevolent and if they knew the needs of the charities. You know, we already have so many people that that give to charities, and is it the government's decision on which charities get funding and which don't? So I'm having a very, that's part of the reason I put it on here, so that, you know, as you guys know, we can't talk about this stuff <laughs> unless we're having a workshop or a public meeting. So to get it on the floor so that we can talk about it, I put it on the agenda because it is, it is a very, difficult decision and I'm struggling with the same thing so pray for me as well. well I'm not struggling near as much when I see a hungry child or somebody not have a place to live or when the kid doesn't have anything to eat I don't have that big a problem myself I want to feed that child because we can't wait around that's my personal philosophy Yes, and my I dad was an all-field roughneck. When my doctor asked me, or you go to a new doctor, one of the questions they always ask you is, are you allergic to anything? And I always say yes, because they're just writing down the chart and busy, you know. I say, poverty. And they'll stand up and look at, I've been there. I don't want to go back. And when you have hungry children, that are worried about where they're going to eat, what they're going to eat the next day. How is that helping that child? I don't have a problem with it, folks. I tell you what, that ARPA money, in my opinion, was to help out people with problems right now and feeding and eating and getting gasoline to go to jobs and stuff. That's our immediate problem right now. And I like the problem right now, if we could give them a better education and an opportunity to learn. How can you learn anything if you're going to school starving? I've been to Cuba. We're in Cuba. They give a glass of water and a tablespoon of sugar. That's most of the children's breakfast in Cuba. And I'm sitting up there with a bunch of people and we got fruits on one end and we got all different kind of eggs and hams and stuff like that and I could hardly eat after our guide told us all about that. So. My question is, I'm not anywhere, we should have a total plan, not take one element here and pick on the 501c3. That's the last thing we need to do. Let's figure out all these other things that we're talking about. Infrastructure, wastewater. I don't think wastewater, Ms. Commissioner Wilson said at the workshop, I mean, Commissioner Eagle said at the workshop, that unless the city of Granbury is going to go along with, that's dead. I think. $5 million 
to regional wastewater is a minuscule amount. I'd rather see that feeding kids and feeding housing and getting rent and keeping people from evicting so they have something to do and getting some education. Education is the key, like Mrs. Mack said, for turning lives around. If you don't educate people, you're not going, they're going to keep that same cycle of poverty. That's why forward training is so good. What they do, and I do support forward training, and I think Katie can tell you that, is that it breaks a cycle of poverty. You take a woman that has no education, nothing, and three kids will go to that school. She will get a job. She will get government housing. And I heard, I was at the other housing project and something unrelated where that lady got a better job and said, I'm going to give up my government housing and let somebody that's more deserving have that house because I can afford to pay rent in a regular house. That's what it does. And all her kids are excelling now in school. It breaks, breaks cycles of poverty. Just give these kids a chance. They just need a chance. And they need food and shelter and somebody there. People are working double shifts and triple shifts in order to try to make a living here. That's just not right, folks. Not here in Hood County. We need to we need to do better than that. And Hood County is better than that. So I'm totally against putting a cap of any money on 501c3 corporations. Let's get a project and a uh, like the second part of this is develop and submit to the commission's court an application process. We had an application process the first time, didn't we, about we looked at all the charities. Submit your deal. Let's give it everybody. Let's submit it and then let's do what we can. Let's apportion what we can and do what we can. Go ahead and put infrastructure or wastewater or whatever on this. But well, let's do it all at once. Let's don't hamstring the 501c3s. There are more than 30 of them here. And everybody that spoke so far today has never received a penny from anything. So I'm totally opposed to putting any kind of cap on these ARPA funds. That's my position. So. Yes, ma'am. I represent two 5013Cs here in Hood County. I'm not going to name them for promotion purposes or anything like that, but I feel the same way you do, and I feel the same way you do. And I also have listened recently to the George Mueller story, and if you've never heard it, he was famous for prayer and depending on God, and I do think if you turn back and let the public know what the issues are more and more, like the people who are working the double shifts or the people who need gas in their car, I think you're going to find out that this, commi this community will get behind it and that there is more than enough funds here in this community that you really won't have to use that money. And maybe you can fully fund the volunteer fire department or get a paid fire department. I don't know. I don't fully understand this issue, so it's a little bit daunting to even speak about it. But I know that the ones that I'm working with, we are literally on our knees fasting and praying for God to bring the funds. Because... Well, one, we, anyway, it doesn't matter. You understand. But I am in the same terminal you are because it comes with strings and it comes with all kinds of stuff. And I, besides, the people in this county can most likely handle the problems if they just knew about it. So the Hood County News, that'd be perfect to, get, to really highlight where the funds are needed and let the good people of Hood County get behind it. So that's, that would be what I would support. Then you can handle the city issues that you've got, like the fire departments they want to keep bringing up but i'm sure there's more that are just like it that's probably the main one right now that i can think of maybe the school i don't know maybe they need more help with the kids that are going without thank you well i'm going to make a motion and we'll see where this goes <laughs> so i'm going to make the motion that the commissioner's court um, that the hood county sets up a, sorry i'm kind of doing it as i go so let's see that Hood County will request the Hood County Department of Emergency Management to develop and submit to Commissioner's Court an application and review process for awarding funds for any project um, in Hood County. That's not necessarily 
just for 5013Cs, but <clears throat> any project, infrastructure, whatever, that there needs to be a application and review process for that, and that the commissioner's court will then review those applications. That's my motion. Should I repeat it? It was kind of long. <laughs> okay. Well, as I understand it, you're making a motion that you request in the Hood County Department of Emergency Management to develop and submit to the commissioner's court an application and review process for awarding any of the ARPA funds to any organization or entity in Hood County. Or yeah, even or how project. the commissioner's court spends it? Yes. Yeah. So any any any, ARPA any use funds. of the ARPA funds will go through a review process. We already have that kind of in place, don't we, Margaret? Not so much. Okay. So I I would agree with that, and you could agree with that, and give us the stuff, and we will come back and do it. So yes. I'll do, I'll agree with that. I'll second that motion. Okay. All right. We got a second. Thank you. A motion has been made by Commissioner Samuelson and seconded by the county judge to ask the Hood County Department of Emergency Manage Management to develop and submit to a commissioner's court an application review process for awarding the remaining ARPA funds so that any organization or entity in Hood County submit a, an application to the commissioner's court and that application be reviewed and then voted on by the commissioner's court. And also any other project that we... Okay, or any other project, all three of them. Yes. Then. Okay, that's three Got that, Kate. Okay. Does that make sense, Any further discussion? Okay. Well, wait a minute, I, I want to make sure this is clear. You're talking about your motion because it's, I want to make sure well, I'm it clear. It was a little long. And We're just talking listen. about right now coming up with a process. Yes. To figure out how to allocate the funds. Oh, yes, right. the 5.7, whether it's to internal county or county projects, infrastructure projects, other organizations in the county. 40501C3. Yes. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you very much. Okay. One thing I want to add real quick. As I stated in my mission statement December of 2019, I give and I challenge the rest of the court. I give at least 10% of my gross monthly to other charities within the county. I challenge anybody else that's having trouble with some of this ARP money to do the same. Thank you. Good. May I have one more comment? Yes, come on up. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for honoring my request. Mark Lowry, I'm a Hood County resident. Uh, I just have to make a statement on this. This money is not an unendless pot with the federal government. If we look at our federal government, it's in a tragic mess right now. We've got this money strategically. Strategically, you've got to spend this money so because it's going to go away at some point. We've got to make sure we strategically look at it. I appreciate the conversation. I agree with all three of you. The most important thing I think has been said today that we need to consider is this GED program. Judge, you said it. If we don't educate these people, they're going to end up in your new jail. We've got to, we've got to, the school board has got to establish a great school system, and those that fall aside, we have to have a program, whether it's forward training or something else. We've got to educate these people. So the two issues, that money's going to go away. That pot is not endless to us. And we've got to educate these children. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, Ms. Jennifer Lawson, consider and take appropriate action regarding the policies and procedures for the Hood County Bookmobile. Oh. <clears throat> I think we can all agree with this on the deal. I'm going to tell you what. Hi, Robin. So. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good. Robin um, is going to be the bus driver of that big, yeah. beautiful bookmobile, by the way. She yeah. is our outreach and uh, mobile services coordinator. So we've already been doing outreach uh, the last year since she's been with us full time. So, and we already have 3,000 books ready to load on that bookmobile when it gets here. So we're, we're ready. I'm sure something will come up where we haven't, hopefully we've thought everything out. But, um, and I'd like to say thank you for uh, funding the bookmobile. I know that that was a, a, big, a big thing and we appreciate it. And I know that the, uh, the citizens of Hood County will appreciate it. Being ha able to have access to things that other citizens have right here in town brought to them so that they can have the same access. So that's really important. Um, today we're just bringing forth uh, Hood County Library Mobile Services policies. We had to write policy so that we could run the bookmobile efficiently. And so what we did is we took the uh, library's main policies and procedures, and we also looked at, Robin did some research on best practices with other bookmobile uh, services throughout the nation to kind of see what it is that um, works and best practices, and so we took the things that she found plus what we already have in policy and then we she rewrote and we revised to make it fit our needs and i'm sure that as we go out there we're going to find things that we might need to change because we're new to this so um i have visited with all of you about that i went ahead and printed another copy because we did add one thing and we added it after uh, we visited with a couple of you so i will Hey, thank you. Uh, the main difference, basically, with the mobile services that's different than the library is checkout limits. Uh, we can't have someone at the library right now. You can come in with a regular account and you can check out 20 items per card. If we let everybody on the bookmobile come in and check out 20 items, we'd have to go back and refill the bus before we could go to our next stop. So there, there's only 10 items. Uh, another thing that we have uh, made a change in is, uh, is one of the um, account types. To get a regular account at Hood County Library, you have to have two things. You have to have a, a photo ID issued by the government, plus you have to have a proof of residence, a uh, voter's registration card, uh, you know, bank statement with your name and address, those kinds of things. We also have temp accounts for those who have moved here, have an address here, but haven't changed their driver's license yet. We also have um, non-resident -res people. There's people in Erath County and surrounding counties that come here for a library. And so they, their uh, limits are different than a regular account. But we decided to add an account type for the bookmobile just called bookmobile account type because a lot of the places that we're gonna serve are transient. And so we want to be, they might not ever change their driver's license. They'll, they might move five times and not change their driver's license. But we know that they're living in that neighborhood. So we've created an account type that they can only, you know, you access books through the bookmobile and have a, a certain amount of items they can check out. Um, the library and the bookmobile will, will reciprocate with each other. You can turn your items in at both locations. Um, you can check items out at both locations unless you just have a bookmobile account type then you're kind of limited to the bookmobile. Another big uh, change from the regular policy is the fees and charges. We don't want Robin to have to carry money with her from stop to stop. I feel like that's not safe. And so uh, we won't charge late fees. The library has late fees of 10 cents a day per day that it's late up to a $3 amount per book. Um, but with the bookmobile, what we're gonna do is if we have a family or a group that people who are continually late, we just start reducing the amount of items they can take out. Now, if they lose an item and they don't bring it back, it'll be the same procedures that we do in the library or that's been done in the library for years and it's never been in our policy. So I want to add that in so that people are very well aware of what happens. Um, so when, when people are overdue on a, on a book, one day after the item becomes overdue, they get a friendly reminder, hey, 
your, your item is out. And remember, overdue, really, they can check out a book for three weeks. And if nobody's on hold for it, they, it'll automatically renew two more times. So you can ultimately have an item out for nine weeks and never be charged anything. And once we did that, we have seen a, a huge decrease in overdue items. Um, as items continue to be late, this is on page seven, on items, uh, as items continue to be late, patron will receive a phone call from library staff. We always do that, just a real friendly call. Hey, do you still have books out? You know, get them back. Um, then patron will receive another email or text asking them to return the items to the bookmobile or library. And after, it's typically anywhere from 30 to 60 days after the message, a patron will receive an overdue letter from the county attorney. That's just been a thing that's always happened. If you don't get your books in, um, we are still trying to protect county assets. And so um, if you never bring them back, the county attorney gets the names. They send out a letter. Typically when that letter goes out, they bring up their books back. <laughs> so that's good. Um, and then they're still able to use, because their account gets blo blocked if they have items out that they haven't brought back. Um, so that's the same on the bookmobile as it is in the library. And then uh, the children policy is a little different. In the library we have it where children birth to age seven have to be in the vicinity of their parent or guardian. Children eight, uh, ages eight to 12 can be in the library in, in the sections that they need to be in as long as they have a parent in the building. Um, and then of course, 13 and over, they can come to the library without a parent unless they misbehave and then we will make them come with the parent. But on the bookmobile, because we're gonna be going to locations uh, where they might be just getting off the school bus or their parents are at work, we have made it that children's age birth to age seven can come with an older sibling as long as that sibling's 12 or older because we, we don't wanna be the roadblock to give these kids access. So that's an, our family's access. So that's kind of um, where we're at on those. So those are the policies that we would like to put in place, knowing that we may have to change some as we go out there and figure out what's best practices for Hood County. Good. Very good. You think of everything. This is gonna be a good, good project. So I dare hear a motion. Yeah, Judge, I'll make the motion that uh, we approve the policies and procedures set forth for the Hood County Bookmobile. Okay, a motion been made by Commissioner Andrews that we approve the policies and procedures for the Hood County Bookmobile, second by Commissioner Wilson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you all both Thank very you. much. Good luck. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna take, Sheriff, before we come up here, let's take a 10 minute restroom break here. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Hey. <laughs> it's now 11.28, and I'm going to report it back after a brief restroom break. And we've got item number five, discussing the appropriate action to complete the other victim assistant grant, OVAG, victim coordinator and liaison grant, DCLG 2024 to 2025 grant applications, Sheriff Deeds. Judge Commissioners, we've been, um, had this basically the same grant for many years uh, that we brought to court. Um, our victim grant, victim coordinator, she does a great job with everything she does. She excels um, and takes care of a lot of people every day. She works hard. Um, so I just am here to ask that we move forward and get this signed off by the court so we can submit it. Uh, the date is, has to be submitted before April 14th, so we're well ahead of that. But, um, so I have confidence we'll get it approved again, but it takes your, your signature and the court signature on, on the resolution and different parts, so. That is the same thing as on number six. Yeah, the grant application on number five is a thick packet um, that you should have, and that just breaks everything down. Um, the resolution is number six. Um, that's just a one piece of paper thing for the commissioners to sign. Um, and the supporting documents, number seven, that's one where you sign as a judge. 
So it's on there three different items. These are all the grants that we have renewed for the last four or five years, I'm not for sure. Oh, it's 2007. Yeah, it's it, before I was the sheriff. Yeah. yeah. So it's ever since 2007. So I guess I you just do take the five, six, and seven because of the lateness of the hour and just say they're all dealing with the victims resolution grants that we have. And do I hear a motion to go ahead and approve five, six, so I'll make that motion that we approve the item agendas five, six, and seven, which is to take the action to complete the other victims assistant grants, victim coordinator and layers and, and grant, and authorize the county judge and commissioners to sign the resolution for the VCLG grant reference ID number two zero two four. Dash four three set zero six nine two or six nine four two three five five and authorize the county judge to sign the statement supporting the submission of the application to the office of the attorney general for that same reference ID number. Second. Okay. So we have the motion made by Commissioner Wilson to sign the resolutions that accompany all of the grants. DCLG grant reference and supporting documentations for five, six, and seven. Second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sheriff. Item number eight consider and take appropriate action to replace the skid unit on Brush 47, a county owned vehicle. This includes the tank pump, plumbing, and installation, which failed while responding. The department feels that smoke from wildfire best meets the needs of the for this repair. Estimate is $24,307.78 to be paid from Fund 55. Judge, commissioners? Sir, right here. Yes, sir. I, I brought uh, Bobby Grossman with me. He's, he's from De Cordova. Um, I know I did put on there that it failed while responding. After further research, it's actually a 20-year-old piece of apparatus. So, in, uh, around 20. So, in the past, what we have done when we have upgraded truck chassis, we've taken the bed off of the truck that we were replacing, put it on the new chassis. I think it's been done three times with this particular truck bed. So, the, the pump and the tank and everything on it also is around 20 years old. The pump's leaking, the, the tank is leaking, it, the, the, the motor's always being band-aided and put back together. What they're looking at doing is replacing the whole skid unit, which is the tank and the pump and the motor on the back of that truck with a new one. So essentially, I would like to say that we're adding 20 years of life to the truck bed at the very least. That's wildfire truck and equipment sales is the, your recommendation? Yes, sir. Um, I originally started with four quotes. One of the four did not include installation. It was just the, the pump and tank, and it still came in at 21000 The The quote from Wildfire is 24307 and 78 cents. That's everything built, put together, and installed. And they're out of Alvarado? Yes, sir. And they have uh, built several trucks for us in the past. And you know, they have, the Dacredova Fire has a prior history using you know wildfire also. And, yes, sir. You know everything turned out well on that. Yes. So. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I've had a couple of questions and conversations about this. Um, so, one of the quotes which you have, because of the all the discussion we had previously in commissioner's court this morning you were able to get a, a renewed quote because the quote that was included in our packet had expired on february 12th so now you have a, a quote that's effective yes, for this time period that, that was emailed to us during the uh, marathon conversation yes. and it's okay. dated for today so Thank it's you. and then the second quote um for neil is 24,995. so just so everyone's aware um our purchasing guidelines state that you need four quotes if it's going to be over 24999 So that's just 
under the limit, and then the third quote was over. So Glenn's not here, um, but I'm, I'm questioning whether we have three valid quotes because there's one is over the 24999 um, I'm not, I'm not saying we don't need to fix it. We definitely need to fix it. I just want to make sure we're using the right process and following our guidelines. Right. So in my discussions with Glenn, um, that fourth quote that I had that was from Casco that did not include the installation, his recommendation was to remove that one altogether because it wasn't right. comparing so apples to apples. And he says because of the quote that we're going with is below that benchmark, that we would still be valid with the three was how it was explained to me. Uh, well, that makes sense that if you're spending less than the 24999 then you need three three quotes even if one of them goes over. I guess that 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 sounds reasonable to me. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> that was just my, that's my understanding. Any other comment or question? If not, do I hear a motion? So I move that we approve to replace the skid unit on brush 47, a county-owned vehicle that includes the tank, pump, plumbing, and installation, which failed while responding. The department feels that the quote from Wildfire best meets the needs for this repair at an estimated cost of 24307.78 to be paid out of Fund 55. Second. Okay, look to me by Wilson to replace the skid unit on brush 47 and report this with the rest of the motion. Twenty-four thousand three hundred seven seventy-eight to be paid from fifty-five. Second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Motion carries by zero. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I hated that when planes break out while you respond. I gotta go. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Speaking up, right. he's responding now. Okay. Good. <laughs> That's Bye. good. Time to go. Out there. Quit lollygagging. All right. Consent agenda. Does any of the commissioners wish to pull anything from the consent agenda? I need to make a change. I'm sorry? I need to make a change on a line item transfer. Okay. The court recognizes the illustrious court key head. What does it change? Okay. Under B, dedicated and accounting line item transfer, item number two, B, should be zero. Item H should be one million five hundred and thirty nine thousand one hundred and six dollars and seventy eight cents. When these two for fund fifty five and fund eighty three are processed, they will exactly match the cash in the bank, which is hard to do, but we've we've done it. So that's I want to make sure everyone's aware of that change. Okay. With that change. Um, is um, any commissioner wish to pull anything, modify anything, or do I hear a proper function? Yeah, Judge, I'll, with those changes, uh, move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, motion made by Commissioner Andrews. With the changes, I expect you could just state it in the record. Uh, approve the consent agenda, second by Commissioner Samuelson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Motion carries by zero. That brings us now to item number nine. Uh, road ops. No road ops and no development. What? Okay. That brings us to financial perspective here. Good morning, Judge Commissioners. For this court, expenditures, expenditures are $996,685.39. You've all been given, given advance documentation regarding these expenditures and a spreadsheet of payments over $10,000. Any questions? Yeah, Judge. Yeah, I move that we pay the pay the bills for nine hundred ninety-six thousand six hundred eighty-five dollars and thirty-nine cents. Second. 
Okay, a motion has been made by Commissioner Andrews to pay the bills in the amount of $996,685.39, second by Commissioner Wilson. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Motion carries 5-0. Next. Next we have the acknowledge and accept the 2020 through 2023 review of the county clerk's financial records. We did this because we were trying to determine why there was a negative balance in December of 2020. We discovered that was a house account error. Ms. Lang has found that error. She's going to make that correction. We have some issues with the date. I have full confidence that from now on the month and the year will be on the uh, monthly reports. Also, I have given her copies of the October, November, December, January, and I will complete a February one of an amended report so that we can get this money straightened out. We ask that the bank reconciliations be reviewed thoroughly. There were some errors on bank reconciliations that when those errors come to us and I do what's called a proof of cash, it's a one month synopsis of the monies. So I make sure in that month, do you have enough money? If you had to close your doors, could you pay your bills? So that's why we do it monthly. We make sure that there is enough money, that there's not a negative amount. So that's when you don't have a, when I don't have a correct bank reconciliation, it can appear you don't have enough money. So it's very important to make sure that all your outstanding deposits are listed. Uh, the other issue is checks being written out of that account. We've had conversations back and forth about that. All expenditures need to come through court because per code, I have to come and tell you, yes, this is the right amount of money we've spent. And if it's out of a checking account, I don't know. So those are recommendations that I have given. This was a comprehensive audit. We need to do better moving forward. Okay, well, we have two speakers signed up to address this. Tina Brown. I didn't hear. She answered my question. She did? Yes. Okay, good. Ms. Lane? I'll pass. Okay, now that brings us. Wait, you have to, to uh, accept this. To accept this. Is the court ready to make? I'll, I'll make a motion to acknowledge and accept the 2020 through 2023 review of the county clerk's financial records. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, that brings us to the last item. Acknowledge and accept the 2022-2023 review of the Sheriff's Commissary Inmate and Bail Bond Division's financial records. We had a few exceptions, the main one being make the deposits timely. Get the money in the bank. Let me see what else is on here. Girls, y'all have anything? These ladies did the majority of that audit. Okay. I don't know about those two. Well, they can be a little shady, but they're good girls. <laughs> but they, they have done an excellent job. We have a basic format and they follow that and they go above and beyond to make sure that everything is proper and talk to the powers that be in explaining what's going on and ask for resolve with it. So they've been wonderful. Okay. I'll, I'll just add that we did see a huge improvement from the deposits because that has been on our audit for the past couple of years but yeah. they did a wonderful job and there was just a few this time versus so we want to thank them for making the effort making the effort yeah. processing okay I knew that you'd have to save some <laughs> so I'll make the motion to accept the 2022-2023 review of the sheriff's commissary inmate and bail bond division financial records second Thank you. Thank you.